Hello everyone, George here, and in this video we're going to take up from our last video where we looked at how we could turn the LEDs on and off using Tris and Lat, but now we want to animate them a little bit. And if you think about it, all we had to do before was we had to set the direction, right? So Tris A is going to be equal to, in this case we wanted everything to be output, so that's zero, and we wanted Lat A to be equal to uh, FFFFOX. Now, if we go ahead and just push this as it is, what we're going to end up with is all of our lights turned on. And likewise, if we go in here and just set lat to be zero instead, all of our lights are going to turn off. I mean, we covered this last time. But what if we want to be able to pulse back and forth? Well, we need some sort of interval of time to do that. And at first, you know, what most people are going to try to do is just kind of figure it out. You know, they're like, okay, well, uh, I just need some amount of time to pass. So what if we did something like, uh, I don't know, just create some sort of a counter that's going to keep counting. And after, I don't know, it counts a certain to a certain value, then let's have it do some new work. All right, so let's try that. Let's create a unsigned integer underscore. Let's see, let's do a uint 16 underscore t and just call that i for increment. And let's go ahead and set for i is equal to zero, i is less than some arbitrary value. Let's try, I don't know, maybe 5,000, 5,000 something. We have no idea what 5,000 actually means in terms of anything, but let's just use it. And of course, i plus plus. And then when that 5,000 counting is done, then let's uh, change lat a. Let's make lat a equal to not lat a, or that is flipping all the bits so that zero is one and one is zero. So in this case, it starts at zero, so then it will go high and then the loop will continue and then we'll go in here and then once again, we'll keep doing this over and over and over again, constantly swapping what the LED value is. Let's go ahead and push this off to our board. So with a value of 5,000, I'm actually not noticing anything. Let's increase that to maybe, I don't know, 20,000 and try that instead, push that off. So now I'm seeing a very, very fast pulsing on my screen. Okay, but that's still way too fast. Let's do, I don't know, 40, right? Why not 40,000? And now it's starting to slow down. Okay, well, you know, why don't we just do something crazy like 80,000 instead? Double that. Uh-oh, it turned off. Well, hopefully you've been noticing that this number here is way bigger than what I can store inside of an unsigned integer of size 16. So if you think about it for a second, this is 16 bits, so that's 2 raised to the 16th. So 2 raised to the 16th is equal to 65,536 values I can store, or 0 to 65,535. I'm trying to go up to 80,000. This value just rolls back over to 0 when it gets to this number, and uh, basically I never get here, so this loop never finishes. So I would need a larger integer value to be able to work with a number this large. So why don't we use a 32-bit one instead, push that off and see if it fixes our problem. And there we go, now we have blinking LEDs at a reasonable rate that the human mind and eyes can understand. This is incredibly imprecise. I mean, what does 80,000 really mean? We would need to get a timer out here and click it every time it flashes to try to learn and create some sort of a ratio. More importantly though is, what if our clock speed changes? If, if the speed of our computer changes, the rate of these LEDs are also going to change, and that's just going to make it a pain in the butt for us to port this over to anything else. We need to consult some documentation, we need to learn about something called the timer. So of course, we're going to need to go over to our favorite PIC website, in this case I'm going over to my particular chip, and you are going to need a few things. First, you're going to need the oscillator datasheet, section 6. You are then going to also require the general family guide. Go ahead straight to the timer section. So if you go to the top here and you look for our table of contents, go to timer right there. And the last thing we're going to need that's most important is the section on timers, the entire section, which is going to explain to us all of the different uh, special function registers and what we have to do to make them work. If we come down here to the family guide, we have some information on what's, what is a timer, basically. It even tells us where to go for more, which we will shortly. But basically, we have a 16-bit timer. Remember that, 16-bit timer. Remember how we just ran into that problem where if we went over the value of 65,535, we ended up with, a, with an issue? Well, that can happen over here as well if you're trying to do areas longer than that. But we're going to talk about how to fix that. And it even walks you through how to set the timer up, what you're supposed to be doing with each bit, what you're supposed to be setting if you're using interrupts and so forth. 
And really, that's all we need to know at the moment, because most of this information is going to be covered later. But do note that there's different kinds of timers. There's timer 1, timer 2 slash 3, timers 4 slash 5. And each of them have slightly different functionality that makes them work in certain cases over others. But that's enough of this data sheet, because it really doesn't get far enough for us to learn anything. Let's jump into the actual timers data sheet now and begin taking a look at what information that has for us. Right off the bat, it tells us what three registers we're going to need to work with in order to manipulate the timer. Any timer, that's what the X means, of course. And they're all 16-bit. First, we have the timer count register. This is the actual timer value that's slowly being incremented over time, uh, and that's what we want to continue to query to find out if enough time has passed. Next up is our period register. This is going to basically serve as a reset value if we want to. We're not going to be working with this in this example. We're going to set this to the highest value. We're going to be doing our own querying for the period inside of our while loop. And then finally, there's the control register. And that's where we're going to set up all the information about the timer itself and how it's going to operate for us. We're not dealing with interrupts yet because we haven't even covered them yet. So we are going to ignore all that. But take a look at this. This is important three classes of timer, A, B, and C. And it will discuss with you later on in the guide which timer A, B, or C typically works with which uh, integer value of timer. That is, timer A is typically timer 1. And then you'll see about B and C. We're going to work with timer A today. If you wanted to have a larger timer than 16 bits, you could work with timer B and C, basically double up to give you a 32-bit timer in size. But we're going to talk about how we can actually work with a 16-bit timer and not really worry about that size too much. So we're going to skip past timer B and C because we're not working with them right now. And we come to the really important stuff, what the values in these registers actually mean. So we need to take a look here at the T, it'll be T1 con for us. Looking here, we have the, the last bit here, bit 15, is going to be whether you want the timer to start or stop. Obviously, we need to remember that one. Then we got some stuff that's, disc that's not being used. Then we are talking about whether or not our device goes into idle mode. We're not working with idling yet, so it doesn't matter. Unimplemented. We're not working with gate accumulation, so we're going to turn that off. Uh, here's the next important one. The timer clock prescale pre select bit allows us to make that 16-bit value scale much larger. So think about it this way. If it's 1 to 1, you're going to get those 65,000 and so odd ticks before you roll over. But if it's 8 to 1, you get 8 times as many ticks before that hits. 64 and 256 in the same way. In our example today, because we're going to be working with large scales of time in the, you know, the half a second range, we're going to be working with the 1 to 256 prescale value, which is a 1, 1 in bit 4 and 5. We're not working with an external clock input. And then finally, uh, what is the clock source for this? And we're going to be working with the internal clock that's provided with us. That is an 8 megahertz clock. You can look that up on the Explorer datasheet. Now, before we jump in code, this section, 14.5, which is very small and buried in here, is incredibly important. And it talks about the timer prescalers. How the input clock is going to be working with this scaler, it defines the input clock as the oscillations and frequency from our crystal divided by 2. Where does that value come from? Uh, did they just pull that out of their butt? No. Jumping over to the oscillator section, right here at the beginning, it explains to you what this means. So if we scroll down just a little bit, we get to the CPU clocking scheme. And right here, we have the, the processor clock source is divided by two to produce the internal instruction clock cycle. So that means it takes two cycles in order for us to do one instruction. Like I said before, we're running at eight megahertz or eight zero 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 hertz. But we have to divide that value by two when we're working with any kind of instructions. And that's the same thing with the timer. So now we're starting to get some numbers in here. We realize that our timer is based on the number of oscillations of our crystal divided by two, which ends up being four million. Can we use that information to actually figure out a real number for us to delay when we're working with our timer? Well, let's see if we can do that. So let's go into Photoshop really quick. Well, we know that we have, what is it? Eight million hertz that we're working with. And the reality is, though, that for the instruction cycles, that's divided by two. So that's only four million, right? But we also know that this value gets divided again by, what, 256. That's our prescaler value that we get to choose. If we didn't put 256, if we put one here, it would be four million divided by one, which is just four million. So this, once again, makes our value even smaller. So now let's actually calculate what that is, because I certainly don't know what that is off the top of my head. Divided by 256, enter is 15625. So with this value now, we should be able to multiply this by how long 
we want. So this is how many of these cycles are going to occur in one second. So if we want half a second to pass, we're going to multiply this value by 0 0.5, in which case we're going to end up with 15625 times 0 0.5, which is 7812.5. We're going to round that up to 7813. So that's how many of the timer increments we need to wait in order for this amount of time to pass on by. That is 0.5 seconds. So let's jump now over in code really quick and try to work with this instead of working with just an arbitrary value right here. Get rid of the for loop for us and let's first create a function that we're going to call and this is going to be above main and this method, excuse me, function, method is for a different language. So let's do void setup timer one. For right now, we're just going to put everything in here, but if you wanted to pass values in there to make this uh, more useful in the future, you know, go for it. You might want to define some different values in here. So perhaps pound define our number of oscillations FOSS is equal to is 8 million. You might want to define our prescaler, and that's of course going to be 256. And now inside of setup timer, we need to work with those different registers. Jumping over to our documentation, it basically said we need to work with three different registers. We need to work with timer X, which we're going to reset to be zero. So what I mean by that is just, we're just going to make sure everything's clear. So timer one is going to be equal to zero. Next up, we need to set up the period register. The period register is that rollover value. But since we're going to be continually monitoring this ourselves inside of our loop, we don't really have any use for it. So what I'm going to do instead is just set that to the highest value possible. PR one is going to be equal to FFFF. OX. You would use this at, in other cases where we're using interrupt, where we wanted a certain time to pass, this thing fires off, and then an interrupt occurs. But since we haven't gotten interrupt yet, we're not going to talk about that. Now, the last thing we need to do, which is the most important, is actually setting up the control register for our timer. Let's go down this bit by bit and uh, fill it in. And we'll do it in binary first so that we make, you know, it makes more sense. Then we'll convert it to hex after. So let's do t1con is going to be equal to, and let's set this thing up first. So first up is our, uh, whether it's off or on, let's turn this thing on. So that's going to be a one. Bit 14 is unimplemented, so that's a zero. Bit 13 is, do we need to stop in idle mode? We're not working with that, so no. Now bits 12 through seven are unimplemented. So that's uh, 12, 11, 10, nine, eight, and seven. Then we have bit six, we're not working with a timer gate, that's zero. Bit five through four are the clock prescalers, we're doing that 256, so that's one one. And then next up is unimplemented. Then finally we have bit two, this is the external clock, which is zero, we're not, we're not synchronizing with anything. Then we have bit one, we're going to be working with the internal clock, which is a zero. And then our final zero right there. Now let's break this up into groups of four. And there we are, perfect. Let's make that a comment now and make our actual hex values. So this first one is, is eight. The next one is going to be zero. The next one is three. And the final one is zero, semicolon. Great, so now we've set up timer one. Now, how long should we actually wait? Well, let's do define timer wait. And that's going to end up being FOS divided by two divided by prescaler. Actually, this should be increment per second. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Now coming into here, we can create our loop. So let's do another while loop. And this while loop is going to be reading timer one's value. And so long as timer one's value is going to be less than our uh, increments per second value, well, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to do some busy work and wait. But then when we hit over here, we're going to not everything. We wanted this to be every 0.5 seconds. So the idea is that we're going to be high for half the second and then low for half the second. And that'll be on off every every one second. Then we're gonna to wanna to reset the timer. We're responsible for that right now. So timer one is equal to zero. And then this thing's gonna happen again and again and again and again. It's every time it's gonna to continue to do this. Now, the last thing we need to do is actually call our function, set up timer one. So let's do that right here. And push it off to our board. And there we are, it's pulsing roughly uh, on and off every second. And that's the basic bare bones of working with a timer. What you probably are gonna to wanna to do is after you do your setup timer thing, you might wanna instead create a new function called wait or duration or something like that, where you pass it how much time you want to wait for. 
and it will do this for you. It'll do this while loop, but it will multiply i per second or increments per second times whatever value you pass in instead. And that way you now have your own delay function, which allows you to wait for a certain period of time. Now I will mention right now that when I was putting this together, I ran into a little bit of an irritation where everything was running at half the rate it should have been. And that's because my configuration bits were set up by default and that was incorrect. You wanna make sure that you're gonna be selecting for your oscillator here, the primary oscillator. For me, it defaulted to fast RC oscillator with post scaler. So make sure you're using the primary oscillator. And then of course, make sure you're working with HS mode or one of these other oscillator modes. You can read more about what these different modes are in the documentation. Just make sure you do that if you're noticing things seem to be like half a step too slow or maybe half a step too fast, you might have set up the wrong oscillator in your configuration bits. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, if you do, put a like. If you dislike it, then, you know, do that. But put a comment below so I know why. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, always remember to subscribe. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. See you next time. Bye.